So good day, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. I'm going to be reading a interesting sutta today. Uh, the simile or the example given from the sutta has been often equated with the Buddha's teaching, often used as a very a representative simile of the Buddha's teaching. Uh, it's called. Uh, it's the thirty-six point six sutta from Samyutta Nikaya. It's called the arrow or the dart. Salla Sutta is the Pali name. The word Salla comes from the Sanskrit Shalya, which can be any pointed weapon. So it can be a dart, it can be an arrow, it can be a spear. And I'll actually use the word arrow because the dart, at least the way I think of a dart today, is, doesn't feel as significant as, say, an arrow. So very interesting uh, thing the Buddha talks about in this sutta, which is the difference between an event or a feeling that is generated during an event and our relation to that event or to that feeling, our understanding of things. So let's uh, just give a couple of examples to talk about this and uh, Use that to just lay the background for the sutta itself. So I grew up in uh, New Delhi. Uh, New Delhi is famous for its uh, road rage and extremely troubled, anxious environment that you can find on the roads. People are always in a hurry. People are always agitated. People are always trying to get in front of the next person and the roads are always crowded, right? And a few years back, one of the things that I found myself as uh, in my own practice, one of the biggest signals that something has really changed as a result of understanding the Buddha's teaching and practicing, developing my own practice was uh, the fact that before I encountered the Buddha's teaching, when I would drive on the road and anybody would overtake me dangerously or honk behind me, I would get agitated and sometimes exchange pleasantries with the person. Think about them, obsess over what I can do to get back at the other person for a while. Right? Either overtake them or drive dangerously close to them. Something or the other would happen. After I started the practice, I figured that every time I would hear a horn, every time I would see somebody behaving dangerously, I would simply see what I need to do, whether I really need to move out of the way. Is there a possibility for me to move out of the way? If there was nothing to do, I would just let it be. If there was no very specific indication that I needed to process any information that I needed to process, and act upon, I would just simply let it be. I would just simply recognize the event. And this was, again, this is not the objective of meditation or objective of learning the Buddha's teaching. But this, for me, was a huge symptom of the way the relation to events changes. Another example that I often use is uh, something a lot of us may have experienced. So a parent comes home one day from a very successful meeting or a joyful day or a you know good day at work <clears throat> and the child does something, plays a prank. Maybe. And the parent has a very happy reaction to that. Another day, the parent has had a bad day. They come back, child plays a prank and the parent responds gruffly. The first day the child thinks that my parent loves me. The next day the child thinks my parent doesn't love me. So often between events and our establishing our relation to them, our establishing meaning in that event, there is a lot of gap. There is a lot of things that we don't know for certain. The parent loves the child, but based on the feeling that they got from that event, they may interpret it one way or the other, because of the way they have related to that event in that moment. 
the same would have helped for me earlier when i was talking about before the practice when i used to get agitated if i were to learn that the person was driving dangerously because they had to very urgently get to a hospital for some medical emergency i would have related very differently so the meaning i gave to that event the relation i built with that event was based on very little information and not only that the meaning that i gave to that event completely overtook my mind for a long time so this is what the buddha talks a little bit about this is part of the core teachings of the buddha in this sutta he talks about different events and the feelings associated with that and how one may become entrapped in that feeling become completely one with that feeling get completely involved in that incident taking things personally or one may choose to simply recognize it as an event and let it be i really like this sutta and grateful for the opportunity to share it with the group <clears throat> Thirty-six point six from the Samyutta Nikaya. The arrow. I'm using the Kubodis translation. Students, the uninstructed worldling feels a pleasant feeling, a painful feeling, and a neither play painful nor pleasant feeling. The instructed noble disciple. Two feels a pleasant feeling, a painful feeling, and a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. Therein, students, what is the distinction, the disparity, the difference between the instructed noble disciple and the uninstructed world? Venerable sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One. take recourse in the blessed one it would be good if the blessed one would clear up the meaning of this statement having heard it from him the students will remember it then listen and attend closely students so i will speak yes venerable sir the students replied the blessed one said this students when in the uninstructed worldling is being contacted by a painful feeling he sorrows grieves and laments he weeps beating his breast and becomes distraught he feels two feelings a bodily one and a mental one suppose they were to strike a man with an arrow and then they would strike him immediately afterwards with a second arrow so that the man would feel a feeling caused by two arrows so too when the uninstructed worldling is being contacted by a painful feeling he feels two feelings a bodily one and a mental one being contacted by that same painful feeling he harbors aversion towards it when he harbors aversion towards painful feeling the underlying tendency to aversion towards painful feeling lies behind this being contacted by painful feeling he seeks delight in sensual pleasure for what reason because the uninstructed worldling does not know of any escape from painful feeling other than sensual pleasure when he seeks delight in sensual pleasure the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant feeling lies behind this he does not understand as it really is the origin and the passing away the gratification the danger and the escape in case of these feelings when he does not understand these the underlying tendency to ignorance in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feeling lies behind this if he feels a pain pleasant feeling he feels it attached if he feels a painful feeling he feels it attached if he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling he feels it attached this student is called an uninstructed worldling who is attached to birth aging and death who is attached to sorrow lamentation pain displeasure and despair 
who is attached to suffering. I say. I'll take a pause and just quickly reflect on the part of the sutta we talked about here so far. So the Buddha says when an uninstructed person is contacted by a painful feeling, it is not just that painful feeling, not just the event, but the way the person relates to that event. The bodily one or a immediate outcome of the event itself and the mental one, the pain that is caused by the way one attaches meaning to it, one interprets the event, one thinks about the event, one thinks about oneself and there is an unlimited amount of mental proliferation that we can get stuck in. That's what the Buddha says. There's another interesting thing that the Buddha notes. When we encounter a painful feeling, we harbor aversion to it. The uninstructed worldly harbors aversion to it. When he harbors aversion towards a painful feeling, the underlying tendency to aversion towards painful feeling lies behind. So if we look at the three blemishes, right? so they are aversion, lust and ignorance. And here we are talking about aversion. When there is a painful feeling, there is aversion. Being contacted by painful feeling, he seeks delight in sensual pleasure. For what reason? Because the uninstructed worldling does not know of any escape from painful feeling other than sensual pleasure. This is remarkably educated, right? this line. The reason we keep seeking pleasure is because that is the only way we know to get away from pain. Pain and pleasure are related to events and are immediately experienced at the time the event occurs. However, they have their own dangers, which we come to. When he seeks delight in sensual pleasure, the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant feeling lies behind this. He does not understand as it really is, the origin and the passing away the gratification, the danger, and the escape in the case of these feelings. So what is it that one does not understand? The origin and the passing of it. The fact that the event happened because conditions were right for it. The fact that the event will change due to the impermanent nature of things. Due to the changing of the conditions that supported that event. As soon as that those conditions change, that particular state of things will pass away. Does not understand as it really is the origin and the passing away. And why does this origin understanding not come about? Because now the person is obsessed about what they feel about it, what it means. Personally attached and taken up with the way they feel about it. They like it, don't like it. Right? The mental proliferation that is happening. And as a result, they don't understand that these are fleeting configurations of things coming to be. The origin and the passing of it. The gratification. What is the gratification? The immediate pleasure that is experienced or the immediate sensation that is experienced right after the event. When you get away from a painful feeling, there is a gratification temporarily. When you go towards sensual pleasure, there is a temporary gratification. The danger. What is the danger? Once one becomes personally attached with something, if one becomes personally attached with the pain, then one gets stuck in the illusion that unless the situation changes, unless things change, I cannot be happy. I will be forever stuck in this situation. The person gets caught up in the I don't like it nature of their relation with that event. The danger is getting personally attached and thinking, becoming that thought, becoming that event, being 
completely interact in that event. And the escape in the case of this field. What is the escape? The escape is simply to diffuse the craving that is underlying this situation. That is attaching you to that event. That is attaching you to the story you have made about that event. That is trapping you within it. I like it. I don't like it. I have become this event. I have become this thought. I have become this feeling. Everything that matters in the world is now centered around what I want when I am overcome by that story of that event. When he does not understand these things, the underlying tendency to ignorance in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feeling lies behind this. So what happens is, even when we are experiencing things that are neutral, neither painful nor pleasant, we are unmindful of these things happening. We easily get caught the tendency of taking things personally, putting an eye at the center of every moment. That is continuously getting strengthened when we are unmindful about neutral events, about neither painful nor pleasant feel. This strengthens the underlying tendency to ignorance. And due to this underlying tendency to ignorance, we do not understand as it really is the origin and the passing away the gratification, the danger, and the escape in the case of these feelings. <clears throat> Move forward in the sutta. Students, when the instructed noble disciple is contacted by a painful feeling, he does not sorrow, grief, or lament. He does not weep beating his breast and become distraught. He feels one feeling, a bodily one not a mental one. Suppose they were to strike a man with an arrow, but they would not strike him immediately afterwards with a second arrow, so that the man would feel a feeling caused by one arrow only. So too, when the instructed noble disciple is contacted by a painful feeling, he feels one feeling, a bodily one, not a mental one. Being contacted by that same painful feeling, he harbors no aversion towards it. Since he harbors no aversion towards painful feeling, the underlying tendency to aversion towards painful feeling does not lie behind this. Being contacted by painful feeling, he does not seek delight in sensual pleasure. For what reason? Because the instructed noble disciple knows of an escape from painful feeling other than sensual pleasure. Since he does not seek delight in sensual pleasure, the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant feeling does not lie behind this. He understands as it really is the origin and the passing away, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in the case of these feelings. Since he understands these things, the underlying tendency to ignorance in regard to neither painful nor pleasant feeling does not lie behind this. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he feels it detached. If he feels a painful feeling, he feels it detached. If he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he feels it detached. This student is called a noble disciple who is detached from birth, aging, and death. Who is detached from sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair. Who is detached from suffering, I say. This student is the distinction, the disparity, the difference, between the instructed noble disciple and the uninstructed world. So what is it that the noble disciple knows? The noble disciple knows how the mind works. The noble disciple understands dependent origination, understands how feeling leads to craving, how craving leads to clinging and creation of stories how creation of stories leads to opinions and mental proliferation, how that leads to habitual tendencies of aversion or lust and actions that reinforce the story, reinforce that event by continuing to be personally attached to it. The noble disciple knows how to use right effort or harmonious practice. The noble disciple knows how to use the six hours to get out of this loop. The noble disciple understands the three characters. The noble disciple understands that 
the events have come together because the conditions are right for it. And when the conditions change, the event will dissipate. That painful feeling has come because conditions are right for it. When the conditions are right for it, it will go away. And there is no merit, no gain to be had from getting attached in a story related to it and attaching one's happiness to the outcomes of one's actions with respect to either removing that painful feeling or chasing after that pleasant feeling. Then the Buddha ends the sutta with a few verses. The wise one, learn it, does not feel the pleasant and painful mental feeling. This is the great difference between the wise one and the worldly. For the learned one who has comprehended Dhamma, who clearly sees this world and the next, desirable things do not provoke his mind. Towards the undesired, he has no aversion. For him, attraction and revulsion no more exist. Both have been extinguished, brought to an end. Having known the dust-free sorrow state, the transcender of existence, rightly understand. So that is the sutta, the dark, short sutta, very, very focused and dense information, very little storytelling. Great. Happy to hear any thoughts, any questions, any comments, any reflections from your own experience. It's, uh, I would like to talk to you. Yes. Can you turn Can you... on your video, please? Oh, yes, certainly. It is only between a uh, whirling and a novel person. So, the gist is he reacts Balling reacts, whereas the other one is response. But at the same time, karma is there. Whether accumulation of karma is heavy in the in respect of a worldling, and it may be less in respect of a, depending on his stage. Of course, in the message, equanimity is more important. Hundred percent equanimity is uh, difficult for all. Can you comment, please? Very nice question. So the, how does, how do the sanskara say that? Right? So when you say, you talk about the kamma is heavy or thing, you're saying there is a certain underlying sanskara, right? Which is conditioned by the actions and actions that you uh, take and the impressions that you have from the experiences of your life that is continuously changing the tendency that you have. So there will always be a tendency. So for example, one person will have a tolerance for a certain temperature of water. So when there is hot water, for example, I have a low tolerance for hot water. There is a certain conditioning in me. I, there are other people like my wife has a very high tolerance for hot water. So my conditioning creates a painful feeling or pleasant feeling. The same way for traffic, before I started to practice at that time, I used to have a conditioning. My sanskara was such, my actions had been such in the past, my experience had been such in the past that that honking would immediately bring up a painful feeling. My attention would go there, craving would come up and I would act based on habitual patterns because I was unable to let go of the craving. Right? So going, so what's happening is at every point, what is one way to think is that, in fact, there is a sutta where the Buddha says, if somebody feels that karma is playing out and I have no role, then there is no effort that this person is going to take. So the Buddha actually calls out that there is a moment that you can actually make a difference, which is the point that you have, the main volition that you have is in letting go of the craving or staying with the craving. If you stay with the craving, the same habitual patterns, the same interpretation of things are going to come up with the respect to the craving. An event happens, you have a certain way of reacting to that event. You have a certain way of telling your story, putting meaning into that event. And you have a certain way of reacting when you have put a certain meaning into that event. When we get rid of craving, we are changing one ingredient in that situation. It is no longer about I like it or I don't like it. It's no longer about why is this happening to me. It is about something happened. 
then your storytelling around it your interpretation of it changes significantly with this one vital ingredient so it is literally like salt you are putting or not putting in food it can completely change the flavor of the food right so once you remove craving your way of interpreting things changes your actions changes once your actions are not based on craving they are based on what is appropriate what is wholesome they are based maybe in the brahma vihara right what is the action based in kindness compassion etc once you do that you start changing your conditioning so where you have an edifice of dependent origination which is based on ignorance that is what we come into this world with. instead you start creating another set of ways of interpreting events ways of responding to events that is based on wisdom as a base right so every time we remove craving we are changing our conditioning also in to actually act in a way that is wholesome so it is just about so the key to this is not to judge the painful feeling that has come up or the interpretation the key is to determine to be more mindful and let go of the craving that is where the volition lies if we take that fork in the road then the actions are different the way it changes our future processing of events and future response to events also changes but if we take the old fork then all the things all the old tendencies all the old habits that is what will dominate so some flavor of that you know something happens one day you may scream one day you may uh you know just bang your fist on the table one day you may just simply roll your eyes or one day you may say things to yourself or obsess over it right it is just different flavors of the same kind of reaction if craving is the basis of it see the same thing like if somebody has placed something wrongly on the floor and you stub your toe if you have some important work to do attend to your craving with respect to that event diffuses it is caught up in something else now but if you are staying with craving in that event you are thinking why did somebody keep this why are people so irresponsible why am i the only responsible person you go down that same loop every time you go down that same loop you strengthen your conditioning you that action that experience strengthens your conditioning and increases the probability that next time you will go down the same path so the moment that really where we can make the difference is that fork of craving or not craving with respect to that event if we diffuse the craving we are open giving our mind an alternate pathway to go down i hope that helps you're you're on mute ultimately entire message is valid when we see kamo vinyana and vipaka vinyana that in respect of the second person the remaining all aspects depending on our craving it is yes, absolutely only if we uh, diffuse craving any understanding that we have otherwise all the understanding is intellectual only if we actually diffuse craving and act differently then that understanding becomes experiential that understanding actually resides in us otherwise there is a set of we in the dhamma pad verses right we say that uh, just understanding scriptures is not enough actually acting that way is the important no, 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 so no 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 it Expe- is experience is also conditioned experience yes. is also conditioned that is the reason why we are facing all this music music so what does that mean what does it mean for you in terms of action action in a sense right? experience is conditioned but is conditioned by your further actions if you are acting action. with experience it if you are acting with craving it is conditioning in a very different way if you are acting without craving it is conditioning your experience in a very different way true thank you so that is the key point any other thoughts or questions hello sir Hello. Hello to everyone. How are you, Sachin? Fine, sir. Uh, sir, I just want to share uh, two things. Like uh, recently, I got experience uh, from other sources. I was uh, uh, watching the uh, just a uh, YouTube shorts of uh, Sri Lankan monks. In that short, uh, he was uh, telling like uh, 
we will be spending some time for uh, cleaning our body like with uh, soaps shampoos and we spend some time in doing this activity in similar way we need to spend some time in purifying our mind <laughs> this is the first thing sir and uh, second thing was uh, in that uh, shorts he was explaining about uh, the alexander great king he has mm-hmm. last three three wishes when he was falling to death he has last three wishes first we first wish was like uh, where he informed that whenever he passes his body he, he leaves his body he tells them to keep his hand stretched stretched second thing is uh, he tells tells them to take their body his body with famous doctors third thing was like uh, whatever the uh, jewels or uh, whatever he has end he tells them to spread on the ground and mm. take his body like meaning of first one is like stretching arm that we will not take anything uh, while leaving our body second thing that even though the famous doctors are there uh, if one one have, if time has come even they cannot stop third thing like whatever we end <laughs> we cannot take and finally the ultimately two things we will take like good actions or bad actions which we do or pap or punya <laughs> these two things mm-hmm. we will take finally <laughs> this was the two things which uh, i got inspired from it and i was sharing to my friends in these few days yes and in fact i would suggest one should uh, think simply from one moment to the next right so instead of uh, end of life because every moment you are generating a sense of self for yourself and that sense of self is disappearing in, in that moment again in the next moment you are reconstituting that sense of self so instead of thinking so much possibly alexander did not have the benefit of being exposed to the buddha right you can understand this the same teachings from one moment to the next <laughs> that will keep you away truly, from sir. living yeah truly sir <laughs> and uh, this uh, example like uh, whatever the <clears throat> example is it is very inspiration to the uh, true lay people they may inspire with this Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you for sharing. Yes, sir. Any other questions or comments? okay so if no more questions or comments we'll end we'll share merit and end today's session may suffering once be suffering free and the fear struck fear less be May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and agas, mighty power, share in this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, you all.